thank you, Dan, for joining us today. He's the CEO of Insight Finder, but previously he co-founded Astound, an AI platform for service automation, was vice president of product at AI Ops at the AI Ops leader Big Panda, and he's a chief product officer at the security analytics company Excel Ops, and he's a senior director of product strategy at ServiceNow. So, um, and I can keep going here. He's got a great background. He's also has a BS and BA uh, from Stanford. So um, you've been at this topic for quite a while, isn't, haven't you, Dan? Or something related to it, at least, right? My life's passion, Dave. <laughs> That's great. It's great to do what you love. Uh, well, then I'm going to let you take it over. No need to keep talking. Uh, Dan, take it away. Great. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Mahesh, for having me. This is a bit of a homecoming, as I had mentioned. It was 2015 when I first presented to this group. And believe it or not, we were face to face in, uh, in, at the beautiful campus in, at, at Intuit in Mountain View. Uh, great venue, great event. Uh, now it seems, uh, I think about those days wistfully when we could all gather face to face, but uh, I, was, uh, I was with Big Panda then. We had a different version of this discussion. Uh, like Dave mentioned, this is the seventh company that I've started or been a part of applying machine learning and artificial intelligence to IT operations. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, it's a passion. Um, some would call it an addiction, uh, but, uh, but certainly it's been gratifying for all of us in this community to uh, see how the technology has changed lives and uh, to be a part of this, uh, this journey. I noticed some, some familiar names on the attendee list. Uh, I, I, uh, I mentioned the event at Intuit. I believe Shri and maybe Shri's colleagues are here from Intuit. So uh, this is uh, not just a homecoming for me, it's maybe a bit of a family reunion as well. Uh, so excited about today's discussion. Uh, I thought that I would kind of organize it into three, uh, three sections. Uh, we'll open up the time capsule a bit. We'll talk about where we've been as a community. We'll talk about where we're going um, and where we are now. And that's a little frightening, the one in the middle, um, kind of a gratuitous um, use of that creepy image of one of the dancers from the Super Bowl halftime show wearing a jock strap on his face. Yeah, what was that? Certainly not the most uh, COVID safe uh, face covering. But uh, anyway, um, we're kind of in our gangly teen years. So that's a representation of where we're at today. But we'll also spend time talking about where we're heading. Uh, some key questions that I'd like to hopefully get answered. Uh, what can you expect in the future? You know, what is work going to look like in 2025 thanks to the innovations that all of us on this uh, web webcast today are going to be uh, creating? To kick off our discussion about anomaly detection, the history of it, the right way to do it for machine data, um, go ahead and stare at that for a little while. And you tell me if you can find the anomaly. Um, you know, you should just get the $50 Amazon gift card if you can find the anomaly. Uh, I, think, I think Dave is the sponsor. We're allowed to anoint anyone who, who, who finds it. <laughs> sure. To be the winner. Uh, that'd be a, that's a good one. You, you got to provide Dave and I with visual proof, though. Uh, I'll give that a few more seconds. Full disclosure, it probably took me nine or so minutes to find it. It's, it's uh, I think, a good way to preface today's talk about uh, if there weren't, uh, say, uh, 150 pumpkins, if instead there were, oh, I don't know, a million <laughs> or 10 million or 100 million pumpkins, what would it be like to solve this problem? I think you get where the punchline is headed, which is it's not a problem fit for human consumption. Uh, because this does take a few minutes and a little bit of creative thinking, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you the answer. After this point, if you uh, if you chat to Dave and I that you found it, you're disqualified. Somebody found it, Dan. D did someone find it? Yeah, Alyssa Mar. Can you tell us where it is? So, is that can can we get visual proof? I think she had Alyssa. So that's the answer. So you'll notice that all of the other pumpkins have kind of four squigglies on their mouth. And the anomaly here only has three squigglies. So this is what we refer to as uh, 
a very appropriate problem for machine learning or even for statistical analysis and uh, a problem that involves multiple variables. We were all searching frantically. Was it the uh, was it the stem? Was it the eyes? Was it the mouth? Was it the color of the pumpkin? What was it? Uh, so you need to be able to process a lot of information simultaneously. Turns out as a species, we're not so good at that. And this is about the easiest possible kind of problem that we could uh, try to solve together. So uh, one of our heroes in Silicon Valley, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of the company formerly called Google, now called Alphabet, uh, threw down, uh, what was it? I think it was the beginning of last year, said AI will have more impact on humanity than fire or electricity. So you already saw one simple example of where uh, you know, we really quickly exceed the bounds of what humans are great at. Um, well, I provided kind of an overview of some tasks that are really better fit for the domains of machine learning, or in some cases, um, kind of a subset of machine learning is, is uh, artificial intelligence. We typically define artificial intelligence as tasks that can be performed by machines that historically were limited to uh, kind of the domain of humans. And so kind of before we talk about anomaly detection and machine data as a specific uh, kind of use case, um, I want to just kind of give you an overview of just how ubiquitous the use of AI and machine learning is, uh, whether we're talking about image recognition tasks. One good example is reading uh, MRIs, classification tasks, who's a good candidate to receive a loan, prediction tasks, uh, Netflix making, uh, making recommendations for which movies you might like, NLP tasks, a fascinating bit of research. Uh, your home assistant's a good example. Um, another fascinating one is go, uh, go look up some of the amazing projects that um, the NLU, the Natural Language Understanding Framework, or sorry, NLG, Gener National Language Generation Framework called GPT-3 from OpenAI is doing. Uh, one of the recent ones is uh, some brilliant mind had GPT-3 write a movie script and then they produced it and the movie is called Sunspring and it stars uh, uh, the, the star of Silicon Valley on HBO, Thomas Middleditch. And it is awful, but it really is a feat of AI that uh, that, that script was, was able to be produced and that's even in the slightest bit um, coherent. Uh, we'll spend today talking about the last row uh, infrastructure monitoring, where kind of the broader set of tasks is anomaly detection. So I thought before we delve deeper into that topic, I want to give you a sense. Now we're kind of getting closer to our world, whether it's infrastructure management or service management, um, what it looks like to kind of wrap a layer of intelligence kind of you know, horizontally around a whole process. And so I, I, I thought I'd share with you some specific examples of how AI is being used across each component of the service lifecycle. So capacity planning, lots of interesting applications of AI to be able to figure out how many resources you need to run a particular workload. Provisioning, where should that workload run? So whether it's from a cost perspective or a performance perspective, oftentimes workloads are being shifted across hybrid clouds, whether it's multiple public clouds or a private and a public. And certain locations are more appropriate for different reasons for various workloads. It's a hard problem to solve. Uh, feed a bunch of data, train a model, and all of a sudden you can get very, very granular and very accurate and optimized for cost and performance in the provisioning phase. Monitoring, that's the one we're gonna focus on mostly today. Um, how accurately could you get a machine trained model to detect or predict incidents based on monitoring anomalous, monitoring streams of live machine data for anomalous patterns. Incident management, wouldn't it be great? A lot of you said, you know, in 2021, you're gonna be launching AI projects. Wouldn't it be nice if you could auto remediate at the infrastructure level and then ideally prevent incidents from occurring that impact your end users? I mean, that's a way to really be a hero in, 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 uh, in, in the IT organization. One of, the, one of the things that makes our job really thankless is that the time when we're performing our best is when nobody knows you're there. When you know you flip on the light switch and the lights just go on, you turn on the faucet, the water comes out, right? Nobody really wants to know that uh, we're, we're toiling in obscurity in the background. 
but incident management is a great way to apply AI across the life cycle. And then lastly, wouldn't it be nice if you could use AI or machine learning to auto remediate, take that preventive action or the proactive action, and then facilitate a postmortem, be able to provide a root cause analysis of what happened, feed that into your knowledge management process, potentially author that knowledge so you have this continuous learning loop feeding the entire life cycle of an operational incident. So some of this for a lot of us is aspirational, but this is where we're heading. Kind of the world in call it, you know, 2024, 2025, this will be, um, you know, kind of just, just part of the, uh, you know, uh, part, of the, part of the infrastructure that we'll all be living with. So like many of you on this call, I, you know, I've seen the wrong way to do this for the vast majority of the past 23 years. And um, I couldn't help but share one story. Um, it doesn't involve monkeys monitoring servers, um, but I do feel for this poor team. True story, by the way. So a friend of mine who's a CIO, um, we were just kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, opening that time capsule and talking about the early days of monitoring. These were the days when we would use tools like uh, Bull and Babbage or Patrol, Proactive Net, Unicenter. Probably a lot of us on this call have, uh, have uh, used ones like that, Netcool, et cetera. Um, well, this CIO friend of mine said there was literally a time 20 years ago when to monitor applications, this was even before we'd use like heartbeat monitors. Um, she literally hired a team of interns. And once an hour, some, one of the interns would have to go down with a pad and a paper into the server room in the basement. And this is pre-SAS. Um, and literally record an, um, on a map, a list of which lights were blinking. And then, you know, emerge from the server room and, you know, show the managers which of the lights were blinking. And that was how they monitored the servers. So uh, thankfully, we've evolved past that. And today I said, you know, kind of we're in our, the, the, the gangly stages of youth, perhaps. But even today, we've got, you know, lots of rich visualization tools. We've got lots of rich ways to analyze data. Um, but we're still contending with a really challenging set of problems where the volume of data is growing, uh, you know, essentially geometrically. Um, and we don't really have the tools today, um, certainly not based on the way we've done monitoring in the past to, you know, constantly try to create new, new thresholds that, that will uh, hopefully catch the anomalies. You know, we're often looking at beautiful tools, but poor data hygiene fed into beautiful visualization tools makes the visualization tools look really poor. So a lot of us are still kind of, you know, even as we evolve from kind of knock environments to more of DevOps patterns of, of, uh, of analysis and monitoring, we're still not making optimal use of the tools because we're having a really hard time accommodating the high volumes of data. So thankfully we are moving beyond this. We are moving beyond it rapidly. Um, and I thought to kind of uh, tee up the discussion about what's ahead, I'd share some interesting statistics. This is a super low, low number. This is published by Gartner. It's actually a few years out of date, but average cost of a minute of downtime is $5,600. Now, interestingly, if you look at customers that truly are kind of digital native or whose brands or whose revenue depends on let's say an online presence like, oh, Amazon, uh, in their case, a minute of downtime costs them about $220,000. So the value of, uh, you know, world-class monitoring is really high when you think about, you know, the fact that every company is essentially becoming a software company. You know, I contend that if you're a doctor in this day and age, you're essentially a computer with a scalpel. I contend that, you know, if you're manufacturing cars, you're basically manufacturing steering wheels with computers bolted onto them. Uh, so clearly, you know, the importance of minimizing downtime is greater than ever. Uh, interestingly, I was curious about this. Uh, there are about 433,000 uh, search results if you look at kind of Google Trends um, for, for the cost of downtime. Uh, by comparison, that was somewhere around 10 times the number of searches for the weekend who I got to confess I've got kids but I didn't know who the weekend was before Sunday but uh, only 
uh, about a tenth of that number were searching for the weekend over the weekend. Uh, so it turns out this is quite a popular topic of, of interest. It tends to spike. If you look at the Google trend, it spikes to no one's surprise right around when there's an AWS outage. $1.1 trillion uh, is about the amount spent on IT operations just by the Fortune 500 annually. That's based on about 15% of Fortune 500 budgets are spent on R&D. And about half of the R&D budget is spent just on keeping the lights on, IT operations. So you get a sense that what you do is pretty darn important. Um, and the next time you, know, you feel like you or your manager you know, doesn't, isn't getting the, the seat at the boardroom table with the board and the CEO, I'd go back and uh, you know, get, get, arm yourself with some of this data and you'll get that, uh, that seat at, at the boardroom table. So 60% of CIOs say uh, a lack of infrastructure readiness has delayed their ability to serve the business. They've actually had to go to the business and say, I can't do what you're asking to do to grow revenue because our infrastructure won't support it. 40% say uh, they're really dependent on evolving the, their, the, the introduction of AI-based technologies to be able to accommodate the kind of business demand that they've seen, particularly you know, in the wake of trends over the past year. Um, that data comes from IBM. Um, so the picture we're painting here is that our jobs are pretty important. It turns out as a, as a community, um, your role is only going to get more important. And the more we can think about ourselves of, as leaders, not just in the kind of domain of IT infrastructure, but as business leaders whose work truly um, is essential to the competitive work that the company does and the customer experience, the faster you know, we can start to adopt some technologies that might seem futuristic or even non-essential, but I'd argue are completely essential to the proper functioning of the business. So now, uh, now we're gonna get into kind of the meat of the discussion. I thought I'd give you a little bit of background around kind of the science of anomaly detection, where it's been, all as a way to kind of foreshadow the next few slides talking about what we can do to apply the principles of anomaly detection to detecting anomalies in high volume, messy machine data. Um, so you see here, you know, what I consider five um, credible reasons, you know, why you're gonna build this argument uh, to leadership about why anomaly detection matters. Um, kind of as a science, um, anomaly detection isn't new. Uh, it's also called outlier analysis, kind of in the, in, the, in the kind of popular press or even sometimes in the scientific press. It's really the process of identifying items in a set of data that deviate from some kind of normal pattern. Um, so just based on that definition, it's obvious that in order to detect what's anomalous, we need to first establish what's normal. Uh, anomaly detection is a term, it goes back to 1986. I told you we'd talk a little bit about history. Uh, a researcher named Dorothy Denning first used it uh, actually to detect anomalies uh, using statistical techniques for intrusion detection. So her use case was bank fraud. A little different from what we're going to talk about today. Hopefully none of you are going to use anomaly detection to uh, perpetrate uh, any kind of fraud. Uh, we now use similar approaches to what uh, Dorothy did um, to screen for tumors, to manage crop yield, uh, navigate minefields, address global warming. Every Every kind of business domain, scientific domain, uh, defense, et cetera, has an application like this. Now, broadly speaking, there are, you know, call it three ways to detect anomalies. There's just visually, you can look at a bunch of pumpkins and try to figure out, you know, which one has a three squiggly line mouth. Um, there's statistical techniques, which probably most of us are used to. Um, and then there's machine learning, which is what we're going to talk about today. Now, visual techniques tend to rely on kind of graphing in two dimensions, you know, a bunch of data, and then visually looking for peaks and valleys. Statistical techniques, I'd say, kind of involve setting some rules, establishing, you know, some kind of uh, manual thresholds or baselines. Um, you know, anomalies might be points that exceed one way or the other, you know, one or X standard deviations. Um, now, by contrast, machine learning is much more appropriate for complex tasks like infrastructure monitoring. Um, and the reason is because algorithms are better at identifying that threshold when it's dynamic. So as kind of what's normal is fluctuating rapidly, it's a better kind of task for machine learning algorithms. Um, so hopefully, you know, this gives you a sense of why 
the topic for today is very, very relevant to the things that we're doing in IT infrastructure monitoring. Um, and I'm going to move on and kind of talk about what's unique about monitoring machine data and specifically kind of validate what I was just sharing about why approaches involving machine learning, artificial intelligence are really the only way um, to solve the problem when you're looking at, you know, 100 million pumpkins, so to speak. Uh, so first of all, I mentioned, you know, machine data fluctuates. So what's normal changes constantly uh, dimensionality. So one of the things that you'll, you'll hear us talk about is the curse of dimensionality in the context of AI and machine learning. As you look at anomalies across a bunch of metrics, logs as well, there are lots of dimensions. And the more dimensions there are, the more data that you need to have in each, in each dimension to be able to accurately detect anomalies. So one of the things we need to do is figure out a way to reduce that curse of dimensionality. Another challenge that we have is that machine data is seasonal. So if you establish a threshold-based or a manual rules-based uh, uh, baseline from which to detect anomalies, well, you're gonna be wrong on the weekends and you're gonna be wrong on holidays and you're gonna be wrong when there's scheduled maintenance. Nobody thinks about that when they're using manual rules to detect anomalies. Machine learning is really good at that. So you feed it some historical data um, it will quickly learn. It'll establish what a normal pattern is. So you don't have to worry about those um, kind of normal fluctuations introduced by seasonal trends. Volume is massive. So in a typical enterprise, you might be ingesting north of, you know, I have here 50 gigs of data daily. Um, so again, you know, we're getting into the, the hundreds of millions and, you know, billions of pumpkins now, right? So um, I, what do you do? Um, when you're faced with, you know, what has historically been kind of one blunt object, you know, either, you know, visual or statistical approach, well, you're just not going to be able to solve the problem. You know, you really, you're going to face a lot more downtime. You know, it's going to be really hard to detect the root cause of issues. Um, and the reason is because traditional methods, um, regression being a good one, you know, really are optimized for data where there's kind of a smooth trend not lots of peaks and valleys and not continuous fluctuation. Uh, clustering techniques have been popular. And I'll show you actually a live example of where even clustering techniques using unsupervised machine learning kind of suffer from some problems that weren't anticipated as the volume of machine data grew um, because they tend to be slow when there's high dimensionality. Uh, supervised techniques, which are certainly valuable, like I mentioned previously, for detecting tumors in breast cancer or something like that, really fail quickly if you're looking at you know billions of data points because you're not gonna you're not gonna label a billion data points. Um, so you need to rely on unsupervised machine learning that learns uh, what we call online learning. It learns actively by looking at streams of data. Um, and lastly, you know, like I mentioned, using kind of traditional thresholding, it's never gonna work because you know, you literally have to employ an army of, of operators or technicians to be able to constantly, literally constantly monitor what the right baseline should be. So for all those reasons, um, it's messy. It's a great uh, problem that's suited for unsupervised machine learning. So um, this is a lot of words on a slide. Um, I'll try to summarize this into one set of kind of techniques that tend to work well when solving this problem of noisy, messy machine data um, and trying to address some of the problems that we discussed on the previous slide. Happy to share these slides as a, uh, as a takeaway. Maybe Dave can post them on the site. I know uh, several of these slides end up being kind of uh, uh, eye charts. Um, but in any case, one of the ways to reduce dimensionality is through a technique called a SOM, a self-organizing map. I'm not going to go into the math or the science behind that, but that's one way that with um, a, you know, a, a, high, uh, a high dimensionality in data, you can essentially reduce the problem so that you reduce the total volume of data and the total number of data points that you need to have per dimension. Um, we've been talking about the value of unsupervised machine learning, obvious the value there, no need for label training data. Of course, you still need training data. You do need to build a model. Um, but that model can be, uh, can be created and managed um, without the need for labeling. 
uh, online learning, so actively learning from streams of live data, that's what you want to do. Machine data does arrive in streams. Um, you should be able to sample uh, in narrow intervals. So one of the problems that we had kind of as a community, say a decade ago, is that for various storage and processing reasons, you know, the sample rate would literally, it might be like 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and now, you know, you, you should be able to expect with the volume of machine data and the rate that it fluctuates, more like, you know, five minute sampling intervals or even less than that, even one minute sampling intervals. Uh, you need to be able to define an architecture that can support a very high ingest rate. Um, and it should be able to ingest all kinds of machine data, certainly across metrics, across logs. Uh, it should be able to identify when uh, change events, deployment events are the source of anomalies. So essentially be able to map uh, onto a timeline of anomalies, a timeline of changes. Um, we're all painfully aware that uh, in the real world, about two thirds of downtime is caused by unplanned changes. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're not able to just ingest a high volume of data, um, but across types of data sources. Um, distributed processing is important when you're dealing with systems like this that um, are gonna generate a lot of data uh, from a lot of systems. You wanna make sure that you can um, kind of both scale uh, horizontally um, but also in some cases scale vertically as well. Uh, log compression, uh, turns out storing logs is quite expensive. So one of the things you, you should think about when solving this problem the right way is, is my system capable of compressing kind of raw event data um, so that if I'm gonna store it, let's say for subsequent analytics, um, I don't incur the same kind of storage cost penalty that I did when you know I had maybe you know, one one thousandth of a, per, of a percent of the of the data that I needed to store. Um, incident prediction and root cause analysis. These are uh, capabilities of a kind of a modern AI ops platform that you should expect because once you've identified the anomalies, you know, this is not just for academic reasons. What you're really trying to do is kind of feed that continuous loop that I mentioned, kind of the service health life cycle. So what you really want to be able to do is translate those anomalies into the kind of corollary impact on uh, incidents, and then you want to be able to take the incidents that hopefully you've been able to predict from the anomalies and determine what the root cause is. And that's how you really orbit around that whole life cycle where you actually have the ability to detect and prevent and remediate an issue before any users are impacted. Um, and lastly, um, for the sake of management, you know, when you get that seat at the boardroom table, you really want to be able to translate kind of the operational benefits into business benefits. So communicate, you know, how much less downtime has there been, let's say, you know, this quarter versus last quarter. And, you know, what does that mean for, you know, the reduced cost of labor that we have? Maybe, you know, we can shift to, you know, getting in the eating into our backlog, or maybe there's some innovation that we can invest in because now, you know, we get back, let's say a day or two a week of the team's time that you know, we can use to invest in skills and uh, technology that uniquely re uh, requires humans. So these are kind of you know, business insights that you wanna be able to tease out of this uh, uh, infrastructure monitoring capability. Um, and so that's another thing that you should expect from kind of fast forwarding into the future, whether it's this year or next year, et cetera, you know, expect that you're not just gonna manage the full life cycle, but at the end of the life cycle, you're going to be able to have a business conversation with leadership articulating why, you know, these kind of the top nine might be meaningless to leadership, but the bottom one is going to take all of the power of the top nine and translate it into a way that can be used to improve business outcomes. So I thought I'd share five criteria. Again, we're kind of now we're, now we're, uh, we're going down a level in terms of altitude. We're almost at ground level. So when you're thinking about, you know, the whatever it was, you know, over half of you that have either active or planned projects in kind of infrastructure management or using uh, uh, AI to automate IT, um, just kind of five things to think through when you're evaluating uh, AI ops platforms. So um, to nobody's surprise, legacy solutions didn't really support any of this. Um, and like I said, frankly, you know, in the past, it wasn't as, as big of a problem. So we weren't as 
dependent on digital technologies. You know, our brands didn't depend on it. The, the competitor, you know, wasn't a click away. The volume of data was a lot lower. But now what you need to be thinking about is systems that are very accurate, obviously. Accurate anomaly detection is table stakes, uh, but also that scale well. So to some of the points on the previous slide, um, it goes beyond just, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a matter of making sure you have the right architecture in place that's prepared to uh, scale to different kinds of data and to high volumes of data. Usability, you want to make sure that mere mortals, not data scientists, mere mortals can configure and operate the system. We're, you know, we're rapidly evolving from a world where as a DevOps, uh, uh, a DevOps engineer, you know, you'll be expected to keep the lights on, whether you're kind of a developer, you know, being expected to manage your code or you're an operator, you know, expecting to, and you're expected to, you know, develop infrastructure as code. Uh, you know, you want to make sure you're looking for platforms that you can build on and that, that you can take ownership of extensibility. Um, it's really important that they're kind of future proof and by future proof, I mean, there are lots of types of data you can't anticipate. So you want to make sure arbitrary streams of machine data are supported. So whether, you know, maybe you, you're moving to an open stack architecture or you're moving from, uh, you know, on-prem to, you know, a hybrid cloud environment, these things dramatically change the kind of data footprint in order to make up, make sure that um, that changing data footprint doesn't impact your infrastructure management approach um, make sure that your platform is prepared for extensibility. And then lastly, performance. Um, so throttle it, you know, use it at scale, make sure that whatever, you may not be in the 50 gig plus per day category, but even if you're only a 10th of that, you know, five gigs or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, be sure that, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, a distributed architecture that's capable of, you know, rapidly ingesting streams, uh, you know, like I said, scaling up, scaling out, um, you know, it, it, it handles caching in a proper way. Um, it supports, you know, whether you need uh, kind of a more modern agentless approach, maybe you prefer an agent, but all these kind of bits related to the architecture of your solution, um, make sure that it's all in place so that it scales, not just to perform at the level that you're at today, but also at the level you're going to be at in 12 or 24 months when chances are, you know, you're going to be uh, you know, the order of, uh, an order of magnitude greater in terms of complexity. Um, and yet it'll still be probably mostly the same size of your team in terms of humans. So, you know, obviously this is kind of a, you know, a problem that uh, machines got us into. So uh, as a community, we're looking for machines to help us get out of this, this, uh, this nasty mess as well. Um, so that's a bit about how I think through um, what you can do in terms of uh, you know, kind of uh, strategizing about what's next. Um, I, I said that I would share a live example. So um, what I'm going to do is go through an example of uh, a kind of a visual example of a bunch of metrics, a typical, uh, typical set of data. This happens to come from a Cassandra cluster. We're looking at metrics only. Um, but I want to give you a sense of what kind of the wrong approach in terms of anomaly detection looks like visually versus call it the right approach that kind of adheres to a lot of these principles. So let me cut over and let's see, I'm gonna show you a few different views. Uh, this is actually Insight Finder, um, our company. And yes, I'm a little biased, but you know, just not a vendor pitch. This is more just a visual, uh, visual kind of walkthrough. So we trained a model, we use cross validation to split uh, some of the data uh, from this Cassandra cluster uh, into training data. We took the other half and we used it for testing or the other portion. Um, we immediately see using kind of the right approach, this rich pattern of anomalies. Uh, each anomaly has an integer ID associated with it. Um, and then we see below uh, a set of uh, six metrics that came from that cluster. And this came from, I think, five or six nodes in a Cassandra cluster. Um, I can pick any of these anomalies and I can quickly get a sense of um, what is, or in this case, this was historical, what was going on. Again, this was trained on some, uh, some, some test data using cross-validation. I see here there was this issue related to the disk write metric uh, on node three, and I see roughly when it occurred. Um, so just for kicks, I can come down here and uh, I can zoom in on disk write node three, 
makes it kind of easy. I can then go ahead and zoom in on what was going on. I see these peaks. So clearly it's anomalous. It was around that time that that pattern 24 was identified. Pretty easy. So it makes it very, very elegant to see with the right set of algorithms and the right architecture. Um, you read it like a book. It's very easy to tell. And from here, obviously, you know, it's a, it's a small leap of faith to see how you could drill down, identify the root cause, remediate the uh, root cause. Now, by comparison, I thought we'd show you the same data using a different algorithm. So everything about this is the same, um, only what happens if I apply the wrong algorithm? And in fact, um, this is not a crazy uh, approach. This is using an algorithm called dbscan, very popular clustering algorithm. But it turns out, like I mentioned, there are some deficiencies when it comes to traditional clustering algorithms. They just don't work with volume at this scale. They're often slow as well. What you see here in the top line is the anomaly degree. It's pegged at one. So it took that rich pattern of anomalies that the right algorithm determined. And it says, no, actually, every single sampling, every single sample of data from this whole same time window, same data, it's anomalous. Well, let's say maybe I go into the uh, clustering algorithm and I, I tune some parameters. You know, maybe there is, there is in fact, for dbscan and, and a, a parameter called et, the epsilon parameter. Let's say I say, you know, arbitrarily I tune it up. It was one. I'm going to throttle it because, you know, here it's clearly a mess. So I'm going to increase it a bit. I'm going to run the same example. Ooh, well, this looks this looks equally problematic. So when I increase that epsilon parameter, same data, same metrics. Only now, what this clustering algorithm tells me is that nothing is anomalous. So back to the right way to do it. You can see why. Uh, the right approach matters. So when we're when we're monitoring machine data, messy machine data, high volumes of machine data, in high in, 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 in with large number of dimensions, it really does matter which algorithm you pick. And you want one that you know again doesn't require um, you know a uh, a data science degree. You know you you, uh, you don't need to be uh, you know world world famous you know Fei Fei Li or someone like that uh, to, you know to be able to do this on your own. Um, and the right kind of an approach will, will get you that. Again, not intended at all to be you know, anything specific to Insight Finder, but I am a little biased. And I think that you know, a system like this that complies with everything we've been talking about does kind of make it easy to uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, really achieve kind of world-class IT monitoring without having to you know, 10x, 100x, 1,000x the size of your, uh, of your team. OK, I'm going to go back. Uh, and I told you I'd, I wanted this to be actionable. So we've, we've talked about where we've been, kind of where we are. Uh, it's clear where we're headed. Um, thankfully, you know, some of where we're all headed, the underlying technology is available today. A lot of us, for a lot of us, it's really just a matter of kind of maturing process, you know, maturing the organization. Um, but that's what you're going to be doing um, in the not so distant future. Um, in terms of what's actionable, so I kind of took a step back when um, I was preparing for this and thought about, you know, what are, what are the most savvy organizations in the world that are kind of at 2025 level of maturity today? What are they doing differently? And um, let's kind of build up this pyramid. So um, a few things that you could take back immediately and implement, you know, over the next week. So establish what your baselines are for your KPIs. Typical KPIs or key performance indicators might be mean time to detect, mean time to investigate, um, mean time to resolve. But first you have to understand what those are today um, because you're gonna wanna be able to report out on, on improvement. And you're gonna, gonna be asked constantly, how are we doing? Are we better, worse, about the same? So make sure you measure those baselines. Um, number four, um, be in a position to reduce at least your mean time to detect. So certainly anomaly detection is a good way to do that. Um, and one of the things that I know this is obvious, but not everyone does it, is make sure that uh, organizationally everyone's comfortable with how you calculate MTTD. So it requires you, whether it's MTTD, I, or, or R, resolve, um, make sure you understand what the, what, the, uh, what the start and stop times mean. So when has something actually been detected? And when has something actually been detected or um, or what does it mean, I should say, what does it mean to detect something or what does it mean to investigate or what does it mean to resolve? 
But obviously, in order to get a mean time across all of your incidents, um, you need to have organizational commitment around how that's being calculated. Um, again, not, you know, not to talk specifically about Insight Finder, but one of the nice things you'll find in the Insights dashboard and Insight Finder is that all of these key metrics are calculated for you. So when you're ready to kind of, you, you get that audience, you know, in the deep carpet, uh, in the boardroom, um, you, you know, really all you're doing is just displaying your Insights dashboard and it's showing a calculation over time, kind of trending how much money you're saving, how many incidents you're reducing, what are the common root causes of incidents? Um, what's your MTTR? Um, what you can do about it based on what the top root cause patterns are. So you get all of that kind of you know, painted on, on, one, uh, on one canvas. Um, lastly, the real objective should be to improve business outcomes. And so much of what the business is expecting from kind of us as an infrastructure management community is to reduce downtime. So whether you say, you know, I want to stay out of the headlines or, um, you know, uh, prevent my customers from defecting to a competitor or, you know, increase my retention, really lots of ways of saying the best user experience is the one that involves the least downtime, highly reliable services. They perform as you'd expect. We don't want to give any of our customers. We fight so hard to, to, uh, to win customers. We don't want to give them any reason to defect. And it all comes down to, you know, everything at the bottom of the pyramid really rolling up to a healthy IT monitoring strategy that leads you to confidently say, you know, whether you're Amazon at $220,000 a minute or maybe another company with $5,600 of downtime cost per minute, you know, you're saving potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars per month by reducing downtime. So uh, if you're like me, you get kind of passionate about this stuff. Uh, some might say this borders on, uh, on, uh, on geeky talk, but hopefully you're here because you disagree. Uh, hopefully vehemently you disagree. Uh, if you're interested in kind of continuing this journey, I pulled out three, uh, three books that I feel like are good, good reads. They're all at least tangentially related to today's topic. Uh, Life 3.0 is actually a fictional account. It's a little dystopian. Uh, Max Tegmark is a professor at MIT, good read. Prediction Machines, uh, Ajay Agrawal and th this team here, actually Ajay is a, a venture capitalist at, uh, at Bain Capital, um, but this is a good, very accessible um, kind of narrative about uh, the future of AI and the enterprise. And lastly, Toby Walsh writes a good book, Machines That Think. Um, it's almost as much sociological as it is technical, but good read if you're interested in you know, what it looks like to kind of fuse Kind of human intelligence with machine intelligence. Um, so again, happy to provide this deck as a leave behind, but um, good uh, good sources of, of future learning. Um, I thought before I, I conclude, um, I'd share kind of a, a a quote that I think is poignant. I think it's as as appropriate today as it was probably five years ago when when I first started sharing it. What can be predicted is better left to machines, but what requires judgment or empathy? is better left to humans. I think we'll be talking about the same principles in five years. Um, this is not the start of the bot apocalypse. It's quite the opposite. I think what you'll find is that through the application of AI and machine learning, specifically you know, techniques like we've been discussing using unsupervised machine learning to detect anomalies in machine data, I think what you're gonna find is it's gonna make you and all your colleagues the best versions of humans that you can be. Uh, just imagine for a moment, kind of thought experiment, what happens when you can do today's workload in even conservatively an hour less a day? You know, what would you do in 12, with 12 and a half percent of your time back, let's say conservatively? Um, you know, how could you be 12 and a half percent better? You know, what would it mean if you didn't have to miss your kids' soccer games? Or, you know, you could be a better, you know, kid or parent or spouse or whatever it is, you know, invest in a hobby. That's really the promise of the future of applying AI machine learning to infrastructure management. It's not so much about blinking lights. You know, I tell that story kind of in jest about 20 years ago, but we have our own version of blinking lights today. And I think if you remember nothing else from today's discussion, just keep in mind that um, our organizations are looking up are looking to us to be leaders. And part of what it means to be leaders 
is to help them understand that the machines aren't out to get their job, the machines are out to make them better. And the sooner they can embrace some of these technologies, you know, not just is the stock price gonna go up and not just are you gonna get a raise, but you're gonna change the world in the process and you're really gonna make the world better for your customers and for their customers, but also for your families and their families. And that's really what, what I think, uh, you know, is certainly what has inspired me um, over my career and looking ahead, um, you know, I, I confidently say that um, the prospects for applying innovative technology to making life better have never been more exciting. When we come back and maybe, you know, maybe Dave and Mahesh will have me back in a year and we talk about, you know, where we're at as a community, um, I guarantee you, you know, we're only going to be talking about the pace of innovation accelerating. Um, and I, uh, I look forward to continuing that dialogue. Um, and, you know, as much as, you know, you've heard a little bit about what I'm passionate about, um, I, I really encourage you to continue this dialogue, whether it's with me or your peers. Um, that's my contact info. Um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, whether it's now via Q&A. Um, love to have you, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to learn more about Insight Finder. And if you go to insightfinder.com slash request dash trial, you can try out everything that I've been talking about. It's free. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to start your journey or continue your journey that way. Um, and with that said, Dave, uh, if there are any questions, happy to stick around and take them. Um, otherwise, just thank you for the, for the opportunity to discuss a topic that, uh, that is near and dear to my heart. Great. Thanks a lot, Dan. All right. So if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat. That's really the best way. Dave, I had uh, one question for Dan. Uh, Dan, when you look at the, the class of problems, the various different types of anomalies and the multiple domains that we work with and compute, uh, does this lend itself better to a certain you know, class or category of anomalies or is it applicable across the board? All of my comments today, broadly speaking, were about machine data and within machine data, metrics and logs. And I talked a little bit about how you can add context or enrich an incident using change events. So I'm very much talking about things that are in the domain of machine data and typically uh, IT related machine data. Now that could come from any place in the infrastructure, uh, okay. you know, database servers, load balancers, networking equipment, um, any place in the stack. But what makes this particular problem hard is like I mentioned, high dimensionality, high degree of fluctuation. So for other kinds of problems that might not be as complex, um, other approaches to anomaly detection might, might work equally well. But in this domain, kind of the one that probably most of us deal with, um, you know, this approach applies to IT related operational incidents. Okay. Are there any tangential areas that, that you look in, that you're looking at or that you see this being applied to? Or I don't know if you answered that question already, but that you see this being applied to that, that maybe it's not being applied to yet? Yeah, the most logical adjacency is security events. Right. So um, I spent a, a chapter in the SIM space, security incident and event management. And actually a lot of these principles that we talk about with noisy machine data for IT applies equally well. And I, I made the comment earlier about fraud detection, but there are lots of problems in security where, you know, let's say you want to uh, look at a, an access log for a web server and try to figure out, you know, is the janitor logging into the database with root access? You know, it turns out it's pretty hard to find that if you're just skimming the logs, you know, manually. Um, but if you're looking for anomalies in the logs, you know, that rogue IP address or, you know, et cetera, might stand out, but you're only gonna detect that um, using machine learning. Right, yeah, that's an excellent point. Okay, all right, well, we have a question here uh, from Paul, it says, this is a complex problem. Rare events occur all the time. Are the anomalies yoked to KPIs and allowable ranges to limit false alarms? Savvy question, Paul. So the best way to train a model is by associating his, the historical pattern of incidents with the historical pattern of machine data. So then you can essentially bootstrap a model based on KPIs to eliminate false positives. Because you're right, every every anomaly in the absence of knowing what matters, uh, you know, every anomaly might get reported as an incident. 
Um, so that's the best way to do it is bootstrap the model with an awareness of historical incidents for the same period that the model was trained on. Um, obviously, an, another very effective and almost essential approach is to give operators the ability to annotate incidents. So, you know, one of the ways you 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 tune the you know the uh, the, the noise valve is by subsequently deter uh, uh, annotating whether or not that uh, that predicted incident was in fact correctly determined. All right, very good. Okay. All right, Dan. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your talk and enjoyed it learned a lot. And I'm sure the attendees did too. Uh, and now we can turn ourselves to the, uh, uh, the final housekeeping items, which is uh, our raffle and our next talk. Our next talk is infrastructure as code. And that'll be on February 25th. 25th. So if you haven't registered for that already, please go to meetup.com slash svdevops. And one last thing is I've got a, we're, we're, we're taking these talks and we're uploading them after a minor bit of editing to cut out all the little in-between comments and stuff. Um, we're uploading that to YouTube. So you can check out our YouTube, our Silicon Valley DevOps YouTube channel and uh, get notified of the talks there too. All right, that's it. Any last words, Mahesh, Dan? No, I think you thank covered you, everyone. It. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. We look forward to seeing you again next time at Silicon Valley DevOps. Bye. Signing off, guys. Thank you. Alrighty, take care. <laughs>